Commissioner, the next witness is Mr Sam Henderson. Yes, is Mr Henderson in the courtroom. Mr Henderson, would you be good enough to come into the witness box? <coughs> Give us a moment, Mr. Henderson, to organise matters for you. <coughs> Mr. Henderson, would you prefer to take an oath or make an affirmation? Uh, the oath, thank you. Would you be good enough to stand then, please? I swear by Almighty God. I swear by Almighty God. That the evidence I shall give. That the evidence that I shall give. Will be the truth. Be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. Thank you very much, Mr. Henderson. Do sit down. Yes, Mr. Woods. Uh, thank you, uh, Commissioner. Your full name is uh, Sam Maxwell Henderson. Yes. And your professional address is 12 O'Connell Street, uh, Sydney, New South Wales. Yes. Um, and your occupation is that of a financial planner. Yes. Uh, you've uh, appeared today under summons uh, from the Commission, uh, dated the 12th of April 2018. Is that correct? Yes. I tender that summons, Commissioner. A summons to Mr Henderson of 12 April 18 will be Exhibit 2.199. And in answer to uh, two items of correspondence from the solicitors assisting the Commission, you've provided two statements, is that correct? Yes. The first of those statements is a statement dated the 29th of March 2018 with, together with Exhibits SH1 to SH9, is that correct? Yes. Um, uh, Commissioner, there are um, some corrections that I'll take the witness through after I've identified um, those documents, but I'll just quickly identify yes. them now if yes, it's convenient. Yes. Go, go through the uh, corrections and uh, have him make the corrections and initial them, and Do so. then we'll get yes. to the point of tendering. Um, and but has uh, he got the statement in front of him? We, he yes, may I, need I, it in I believe front of he him. Has he has both statements in front of him, is that correct? Uh, I don't have them here. Oh, sorry, there were some further redactions. It's amazing what you can see from up here, Mr Woods. <laughs> there were some further redactions this morning and I think we're at pains to make sure that the redactions are the same on Mr Henderson's statement as they are on... Um, can those Woods. instructing you give him the original of his statement or can someone... Yes, we can do uh, we... We'll do so. Um, just while that's occurring, um, that was the first of those statements dated 29th of March 2018. Um, and the second statement is a 5th of April 2018 statement, is that correct? Yes. And together with the exhibits uh, SH10 to SH18, is that correct? Yes. Now, um, the solicitor um, to the Commission has been provided with uh, a document uh, entitled um, Sam Henderson Corrections that I believe is on the system um, which indicates what uh, some um, data uh, needs to be um, corrected in uh, both of those statements, is that correct? Yes. Now that's a document that's on the screen, it should be on the screen in front of you. Um, Commissioner, because there are um, a number, oh, the Unfortunately, the markups haven't come through in the Commission's version that was sent to the Commission on the one on the screen. But essentially, what this document does is to show the provisions that are in those original statements and the changes that are made to them. And because they are, there are a number of them, um, we saw that it was efficient to provide it in this manner. Um, we might get that updated to the marked up version. They seem to have just been corrected in the, um, the way they've been uh, received. Well, if I deal with it by uh, marking uh, separately as exhibits each of the statements and then as the next succeeding exhibit, uh, the correction to the two statements, uh, that'll uh, solve the mechanical side of it. Uh, but Mr Henderson uh, perhaps needs to uh, uh, be led through the point of whether he... Uh, uh, affirms the truth of the statements as corrected in accordance with this document. Yes, and I'm going to provide him um, with a copy, and I do have other copies here of the marked up version, I should say. Um, Mr Henderson, I'm handing you a document containing uh, a list of corrections um, that is marked up to a number of uh, paragraphs. Firstly, um, a uh, change to paragraph 46 of your first statement, and secondly, some changes to paragraphs 38 
to 41 of your second statement. Do you see that in front of you? I do, yes. And are those corrections uh, to your statements uh, uh, true and correct? I believe so, yes. And other than that, with just with two items, one is at paragraph 15 of your first statement. Is it correct that you are no longer a member of the FPA, so those initials shouldn't be in that table? Oh, that's correct. And secondly, in your second statement, at paragraph 23, there's a typographical error where 12 January should say 16 January in the second line of that statement. Oh, uh, yes, correct. Now, we just mark that change yes. on the original statement and initial that. Yes, we'll do so. Someone will do give you have you a, a pen, pen you? to uh, make the necessary amendment. So that's paragraph 15 of your first statement, which is a line through the initials FPA, as I understand your evidence. And an initial. And an initial next to it. And once you've done that, paragraph 23 of your second statement, uh, second line, 12 becomes 16 and initialled as well after that's changed. Thank you. Mr Henderson, now with those uh, changes that you've um, indicated, are the two statements true and correct? Uh, yes, I believe so. Uh, Commissioner, I tender the two. The first is 29 March, the second is 5 April of this year. Statement of 29 March 18 and its exhibits becomes exhibit 2.200. Statement of 5 April 18 and exhibits becomes exhibit 2.201. Corrections to statements uh, exhibit 2.200 and 2.201 uh, becomes exhibit 2.202. Yes. Ms Orr. Mr Henderson, you're a financial advisor. Yes. Uh, and you provide financial ad advice as an authorised representative of a company called Henderson Maxwell Proprietary Limited, yes. which holds an Australian financial services licence. Yes. Uh, you're the chief executive officer of Henderson Maxwell Proprietary Limited. Yes. And you're also the chief executive officer of Henderson Maxwell Financial Planning Proprietary Limited. Yes. Um, now. Uh, I'd like to ask you some questions first about your business generally. Um, for how long have you been a financial advisor? Uh, I started around uh, 2002, 2003, I think. And I don't recall the exact date. For how many of those years that you've been a financial advisor have you operated under the Henderson Maxwell brand? Uh, I started Henderson Maxwell on the 1st of March 2004. Where did you work before you started Henderson Maxwell? Uh, I worked for a company called Tynan McKenzie. Called Ty Tynan McKenzie. Thank you. You host a television show, Mr Henderson? Uh, yes. A show called Your Money, Your Call, Super Thursday on Sky News Business? Uh, I used to. That uh, show and all the Your Money, Your Calls have uh, now changed. Mm -hmm. Uh, I have been hosting a show called Money Manager on Friday night, 6.30. You also regularly appear as a finance ex expert uh, on Network 10's The Project and on Nine's The Today Show? Uh, occasionally, yes. And you provide general financial advice articles in a number of publications, including the Australian Financial Review, the Sydney Morning Herald, The Age and Money Magazine? Uh, I have, yes. How many financial advisors does Henderson Maxwell currently employ? Uh, officially, we have uh, two financial advisors and we have one other authorised representative who's not necessarily giving advice. And how many support staff does Henderson Maxwell employ? Uh, the financial planning firm has six staff in total, including the two financial advisors. Uh, the other authorised representative that I referred to 
uh, is part of our accounting business. And roughly how many clients does Henderson Maxwell have? Uh, about 700 in total. Uh, of those, about 200 are what we call active clients. Roughly how many new clients does it have each year? Um, in terms of uh, statements of advice, sometimes between or somewhere between, say, 40 and 50 statements of advice are produced. Uh, and ongoing clients, uh, probably about half of that, I suppose. What kinds of clients come to Henderson Maxwell for financial advice? Uh, we have a variety of clients uh, from all walks of life. I, uh, I think probably a, a majority uh, or close to half would have a self-managed super fund. Uh, we have executives, we have uh, employed entrepreneurial style uh, clients, we have public servants, we have all walks of life really. And where you're dealing with um, the half of your clients who don't already have a self-managed superannuation fund, is that something that you often recommend that they set up? Uh, it depends on the situation of the client. We uh, have a process that we go through to try to ascertain whether uh, what type of fund they might want, what sort of ideas they have in their head before they come to see us. Uh, and then I suppose we look at their circumstances and then make some recommendations around that. Some of them already have their minds made up. Some of them are looking for a discussion point to, uh, or looking to us to help them make that decision, you know, essentially making better uh, decisions around their, their finances. In one of your statements, you refer to 58 clients who got a statement of advice from Henderson Maxwell since 1 January 2016. Mm -hmm. And uh, that those 58 clients, you tell us in your statement that 40 of them either had a self-managed superannuation fund or were advised by your firm to set one up. Uh, correct. Uh, now, you've said in your first statement that the self-managed superannuation funds recommended by Henderson Maxwell are established by a related company, which is Henderson Maxwell Accounting Proprietary Limited. Uh, some are, yes. Uh, we usually give the client choice. If, if they do decide to go ahead with a self-managed super fund, we would say, uh, would you like to use our services or do you have a trusted accountant that you use? Uh, in many cases, they already have an accountant uh, and uh, in that case, we would work with that accountant. Uh, but yes, to answer the question, uh, we do have an accounting firm. Uh, essentially, we have merged those now and um, uh, they are capable and they do set up self-managed super funds for clients. And does Henderson Maxwell Accounting charge fees for clients to establish a self-managed superannuation fund? Uh, yes, they do. And roughly how much? Uh, it depends on the nature of the... Um, style of the super fund. So for individual trustees, for example, uh, it might be $880 for a corporate trustee, uh, which we generally recommend these days for uh, either individuals or even for couples. Uh, you're looking at twice that, so around $1760. Uh, and for a limited recourse borrowing arrangement, because you need a, a, a trust structure or bear trust in place, uh, that would be around about $3,500. And are there ongoing fees once a client has established a self-managed superannuation fund? Uh, there is. Typically, uh, a self-managed super fund trustee would pay around two to $3,000 a year. Again, it depends on the, uh, the nature of the investments, how many transactions they do, the complexity of the fund, number of members uh, and the like. And does Henderson Maxwell also provide investment management services? Uh, yes, we do. Uh, and what kinds of investment management services does Henderson Maxwell provide? Uh, we provide a variety of investment services, be it through a, uh, what we call a Henderson Maxwell managed account, uh, which has been set up through a company called managedaccounts.com.au, uh, also called investment administration services. Um, that's probably our chief uh, form of investing our clients' funds. Uh, we also use a number of other platforms. We're not tied to that particular platform. Uh, and with the innovation that's occurred in the industry, uh, that is the uh, provision of uh, a superannuation trust structure, we're now using companies like NetWealth and Hub24, uh, BT, Macquarie. We use a, a, a host of different providers. Does Henderson Maxwell provide both a discretionary investment service and a non-discretionary investment service? Uh, yes, we do. 
And can you explain how a managed discretionary account works? Sure. Um, many years ago, uh, when we were operating under another dealer group structure, uh, we used a company called Asgard to manage our client funds. Uh, and the problem that we had with that when you know, we, we typically didn't use a lot of managed funds, we still don't use a lot of managed funds, uh, we were trying to manage direct share portfolios, cash and fixed interest portfolios in a disparate fashion. Uh, for example, if I wanted to sell Commonwealth Bank shares and buy NAB shares, that might be controversial today, but uh, if I wanted to do that, I would have to go into, uh, to meet with every single individual client, provide an individual piece of advice, have that advice sent back to us, and then by the time we get to trade, it could well be many weeks or potentially months if the client's away, many of our clients are retired, uh, so sometimes the advice would not be returned. It created a very disparate way to manage portfolios. So uh, what we wanted to do was try to create an aggregated way we could manage our client portfolios that was transparent, that is investing into direct assets that didn't pay commissions to financial advisors, and uh, a way that we uh, could move quickly in a share market, particularly after the GFC, uh, if we wanted to trade a, a particular uh, security. So are you referring there to the managed discretionary? I'm referring to the managed discretionary account, yes. Essentially having discretion over the, uh, the client's funds, uh, but within certain boundaries. Uh, and we also operate under a uh, managed discretionary account contract uh, with the MDA provider. Uh, and that provides us the framework under which we can operate. Uh, there is uh, compli a compliance regime around that, having an investment philosophy, for example, or an investment charter, as we call it officially, having an investment committee with paid external members, uh, having a full-time portfolio manager, uh, research and undertake transactions, etc. So that's pretty much how we operate the, the what we call the MDA service. The other option would be more of an IDPS service, which uh, uh, would be usually under a superannuation trustee structure, uh, such as Asgard, Macquarie, uh, Hub24, NetWealth, those sorts of platforms. So Henderson Maxwell doesn't operate the MDA, the managed discretionary account itself then? Uh, we have a, an agreement to manage those funds under the structure provided by uh, managed accounts, mm -hmm. the company. But do you recommend services provided by a third party, which are branded as uh, Henderson Maxwell Managed Accounts? Yes, we do. And who provides the managed account service? Uh, the, uh, the company managed accounts. So what does it's a generic term. Um, what does investment uh, administration services provide? It's the same company. They changed their name when they listed. Okay. Uh, so the two names of that company, so I'm clear. Are I use them interchangeably, so I've been familiar with the company uh, Investment Administration Services. These days they're listed on the ASX under managed accounts. Okay. MGP, I think, is the code. So Investment Administration Services, which is how you refer to this entity in your statements, provides the managed account service. Yes. Um, what does Henderson Maxwell do? Uh, we manage the funds, so we undertake the transactions. Mm -hmm. uh, we set up the client accounts and we manage the portfolios. So you have an investment committee? Yes, we do. And who's on the investment committee? Uh, myself uh, uh, and uh, two other uh, employees at Henderson Maxwell. Uh, and then we have three external members of that committee. And does the investment committee have an ongoing role in relation to the managed account service? They do. We meet on a monthly basis. All right. Um, could we turn to your first statement at paragraph 43? Uh, so these are the fees that Henderson Maxwell pays to investment administration services each year for the managed account service? Uh, yes. So there's a fee calculated as a percentage of the funds under management? Correct. And it differs for investment accounts on the left-hand side and superannuation on the right-hand side? Yes. But does investment administration services provide both services? Yes. And the fee decreases as the amount of funds under management increases? That's right. But it ranges from 0.11% uh, to 0.22%. Uh, yes. 
and there's also a transaction fee of $4.72 per trade. Uh, yes. And then if we could have paragraph 44 brought up at the same time on the other side of the screen. Uh, this shows us the fees that Henderson Maxwell charges to its clients who put their funds in the Henderson Maxwell managed account for ongoing advice services. Yes. Uh, again, there's a fee calculated as a percentage of the funds under management. Yes. And it's 1.1% to 1.8% of the funds under management. Uh, yes, in a general sense, there are clients that pay less than that. But the investment administration services fee is only 0.11% to 0.22% of the funds under management. That's correct. So what value do clients receive for the difference between those two fees? Uh, we provide two levels of service. One is the uh, strategic overlay, so uh, uh, that is around the superannuation advice, uh, tax minimisation strategies, investment strategies, um, uh, superannuation contribution, those sorts of things, um, insurance as well. Uh, and uh, on the investment management side, we have a, an active uh, portfolio management role for clients. And we see that Henderson Maxwell also charges transaction fees. In addition to the investment administration services fees, there's a transaction fee charged by Henderson Maxwell of $10.50 or $21, yes. uh, depending on the portfolio. Yes. But the transaction fee that investment administration services charges is less than $5? Uh, yes. And on top of that, Henderson Maxwell charges 0.525% in brokerage? Yes. So what value does the client receive for the difference between those fees? Uh, this is really around the uh, value of uh, asset selection, so buying and selling of shares, uh, asset allocation as well. Uh, asset allocation is obviously very important when it comes to risk profile. And when there's market movements, volatility in the share market or the like, uh, transactions need to take place quite quickly. Uh, so we feel we're adding value in that area. In your second statement, um, you say that since 1 January 2016, from 58 clients, uh, Henderson Maxwell recommended that 31, more than half of them, invest in the Henderson Maxwell managed account. Yes. And you say that approximately 60 to 70 per cent of your clients and 84 per cent of your funds under advice are managed through the Henderson Maxwell managed account service. Yes. That's a very high proportion of clients to have their investments in one product, isn't it, Mr Henderson? Uh, I don't believe so. You don't accept it's a high proportion? Oh, I accept it's a high proportion, yes. Sorry, I thought you said it's a high risk. No, no, no. What I'm putting to you is that it's a very high proportion of your clients who have their investments in one product. Uh, I think we need to distinguish between what's considered a product and what's considered a service. Uh, we consider the managed account service as a service. That's, that's the name of it. Uh, so it's very much around managing a client's portfolio. It's not like a unitised trust. I think there's a misnomer with the term managed account being like a, um, a unitised trust. It's not that. It's a little bit like a managed fund where you can raise the bonnet and see what's in the engine. Uh, the clients own the individual assets within that. Uh, and having been in this industry for 15 odd years, the, uh, the, the problem we've had is managing disparate portfolios. So looking for a, a, an aggregation service has been uh, fundamental to managing the client's money uh, in the best way possible, the best way we see fit. And uh, that was certainly the case during the GFC where we could hold substantial amounts of cash and move fairly quickly when a market was turning by two, five, ten percent within a number of days. So uh, we, we felt that was an appropriate structure to manage our client funds. Do you, uh, do you take steps to consider whether there might be other managed account services that offer clients a better return or lower fees? Yeah, this is a really good question because the, we were one of the first businesses to start using managed accounts. Um, and what we've seen over the past few years is significant innovation in this industry. Uh, and probably two years ago, three years ago perhaps, uh, we did start using 
alternatives. Uh, and we've started to use those more and more as the industry's innovated. Uh, uh, I don't know whether I should name companies, but uh, Hub24, for example, uh, we are moving a lot of money uh, into Hub24 because of the reporting, the transparency, the client experience is far more positive. And um, uh, we can also, uh, we have been closing down a number of self-managed super funds over the years. Uh, and for those people who are, for example, aging or not in a position to continue managing their funds, these other platforms provide an ideal scenario for managing those funds without having to be tied into any of the major bank platforms. But nonetheless, 84% of your funds under advice are managed through the Henderson Maxwell Managed Account Service. Uh, correct. Um, do you present clients with a comparison of other managed account services? Uh, we discuss it, yes. Do you present them with a comparison, Mr Henderson? Uh, no, we don't. Mm -hmm. um, how do you ensure that the advice that you give your clients is in their best interests if you don't give them a comparison to consider comparing your products with other products? Mm. Uh, I suppose we base that on our uh, extensive industry experience. We look at what is available out there for the clients and we're constantly assessing other products. Uh, as I commented earlier, uh, we are looking, we are using far more extensively now that those products have come to market. So uh, I would imagine that that 84% would continue to drop uh, and that's certainly something we're, we're implementing at the moment. I've asked you a number of questions about investment administration services. Do you have an interest in investment administration services? Uh, no, not today, but I must qualify that. I did. Um, when they floated, uh, I was offered shares in the company, which I took those up. Um, it did come up in the financial, the FPA uh, complaint, and I sold them immediately. I didn't even think about it being a material holding. We don't believe it was a material holding. Um, I certainly didn't need to own those shares. Uh, in such a way that I was looking for a financial advantage, so I sold them immediately when it was pointed out. Right. When it was pointed out to you, you sold them, but prior to that point, your self-managed managed superannuation fund owned shares in investment administration services. Yes, it did. Mm -hmm. Did you disclose that interest to your clients? I did. Can I show you a document which is FPA 0018 0002 This is uh, the Henderson Maxwell Financial Services Guide, version three, as at 20 January 2016. As at this date, 20 January 2016, did you have an interest in investment administration services? I believe so. You did, didn't you, Mr yes. Henderson? Uh, and is that interest disclosed in this document? Uh, I would have thought so. Mm -hmm. oh, well, Perhaps um, we can do this most quickly by me handing you uh, a copy of that document because I'd um, like you to direct us to where in this document that interest is disclosed. I just need to find a non marked one. I am on here. You'll have to excuse me, it's been a long time since I've looked at this document, but uh, I can't find it, so perhaps it wasn't. I stand corrected if it's not here. I'm going to put to you that your interest uh, in investment administration services is not disclosed in your financial services guide as at 20 January 2016. I, I would accept that if it's not there, yes. Why not? Uh, we didn't believe it was a material interest. Uh, this financial services guide records at 0410 uh, that you have a Masters of Commerce, Mr Henderson. Uh, that is correct. I saw that comment. 
Was that correct? At the 20th of January 2016, did you have a Masters of Commerce? I did not. I studied a Masters of Commerce. I think this was taken over from a previous bio and uh, we since removed that uh, in the next iteration of the Financial Services Guide. Taken over from a previous bio, but you did not at any point prior to this document have a Masters of Commerce, did you? No. Thank you. So that's inaccurate in this financial services guide? It is, yes. I apologise for that. All right. I tend to that document, Commissioner. Uh, Henderson Maxwell Financial Services Guide, as at 20 January 2016, FPA 0018-002-0408 becomes Exhibit 2.203. Could I now ask you some questions about the advice that you gave Ms McKenna, Mr Henderson, and the complaint that she made? You've heard the evidence that Ms McKenna gave today? Yes. And you've read her statement? I have. Uh, and you agree that you first spoke to Ms McKenna on the phone on the 3rd of November 2016? Yes. And then you met with her on the 7th of November 2016? Yes. And she sought advice from you about potentially buying an investment property and about changes to superannuation uh, taxation laws ahead of um, 1 July 2017? Yes. She also wanted advice about a plan for transitioning to retirement? Uh, not specifically. She asked me a question about transition to retirement, but not that she sought a plan around transition to retirement. She provided you with details about her current financial situation? She did. Uh, and that included details about her two um, superannuation funds? Yes. And you asked Ms McKenna at that meeting if she'd be interested in managed investments through a Henderson Maxwell managed account? Uh, not as specific as that. I asked her if she was looking for uh, ongoing advice and uh, or whether she wanted just one-off strategic advice, which we often do. And what do you say Ms McKenna said to that? Uh, she was looking for an ongoing... My understanding was she was looking for an ongoing relationship. And you've heard Ms McKenna's evidence that you asked her whether she would consider establishing a self-managed superannuation fund? I have. And uh, what do you say to Ms McKenna's evidence about the discussion that she had with you on that topic in this meeting? Uh, respectfully, I'd, I'd probably offer a different um, line of thinking around the discussion that took place. Uh, I think it's important to point out that it's, it's neither in my character or in my practice to push anything. Um, when a client comes to you with a pre-approved loan of $2.2 million, she's looking to invest into property, she's 56 years of age, uh, she ticks a box to say she's interested in, in a tailored portfolio, she's interested in shares. Uh, it would not be unreasonable given the fact that I write for the financial review specifically, wholly and exclusively on the topic of self-managed super funds uh, and probably 50 to 80 per cent of our Uh, I usually write out a, a strategy in the form of a power planning request form. Uh, so I wrote that out in detail. I do believe that has been uh, provided as evidence. And uh, I spend some time in, in formulating that. Uh, How much time did you spend in formulating that, Mr Henderson? Uh, probably two to three hours. This is two to three hours in formulating the instructions to the power planner, is that right? Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, and 
you were, I assume, when formulating those instructions, considering Ms McKenna's existing superannuation products? Yes, I did. Um, that being said, unfortunately, we were making those decisions on flawed research. Uh, I was of the belief that her superannuation fund was, uh, despite the fact you referred to it as deferred in, in the fact find and certainly in our discussions, uh, that it was a defined benefit fund uh, where you have a member balance and a defined benefit portion. Uh, so my recommendations and statement of advice was based upon that understanding of her uh, superannuation fund. Uh, I apologise that that research was incorrect. My understanding of the product was incorrect. Uh, it, it was my, my strategy essentially was based on, on flawed, my flawed understanding of her situation. What led you to believe that it was a defined benefit, uh, Mr Henderson, when it was described, as you've just acknowledged, in the initial electronic questionnaire as a deferred benefit fund, mm. and the other information you had was the member statement which clearly described it as a deferred benefit fund? Yeah, I, I, that's a good question. Um, certainly in hindsight, I look back and, and I've been asking that question for the last 12 months or 18 months um, with great frustration. Uh, the, 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 I think the, the core reason was really around the uh, fact finder, what we call the fact finder, the client um, uh, questionnaire. Uh, it did present a figure in SAS of the full amount available at maturity. Uh, our researcher, uh, my client services manager, made inquiry and they said that the amount available was X, and the difference between X and Y in my mind was the defined benefit portion, which we would always leave. We, we invariably never uh, uh, recommend clients take out a, a defined benefit portion, and my belief was there was a member portion in the fund uh, that was essentially available for uh, rollover. You say that your researcher made inquiries about Ms McKenna's superannuation position. How did your researcher do that? Uh, there was a uh, authority uh, signed by Ms McKenna in our first meeting and uh, there's a file note to suggest that was sent off on the 7th of November 2016. I don't think you've quite answered my question, Mr Henderson. Um, how did the researcher, what inquiries uh, did the researcher make? Uh, they rang uh, SAS. All right. Uh, could I ask that we now play an audio recording, uh, which is FPA 0006 0010476, which has been edited, Mr Henderson, to remove some personal information. But I'd ask that we play that recording now. Welcome to Safe Surfing. You're speaking with Christina. How can I help you today? Hi, Christina. Christina, I was wondering if I could get some information, please. Mm -hmm on my member number. Yes, please. Now, I've been given some questions to ask and I know I hold a deferred benefit. Okay, sure. The, the member number I have here is... Okay, your full name and date of birth? Donna, Sarah McKenna. Thank you. Donna, your mailing address also for security? It's the same. Perfect, thank you. Then how can I help you? No, I just want to know what my current balance is, please. Mm -hmm. Of course. Let me just access the account. Okay. Uh, just before I do read out that account balance, I need to advise you that it is at, um, an estimate and it is indicative only, and it is mm -hmm. based on your current position in the scheme. It's recorded in our system. So I'll make it my right. moment there. Okay. Donna, I just have to do a quick calculation there for you. Do you mind if I place right. your hold? Yeah, no. Thank you there. I won't be long. Thanks. Hey Donna, thank you so much yes. for your patience. Okay, That's all right. so as you know with SAS, our normal retirement age is age uh, 58. So okay. if you were to access your funds earlier than age 58, uh, mm -hmm. the estimated lump sum amount would be Mm -hmm. But if you were to wait until age 58 and over um, meet a condition of you permanent retired, then your estimated lump sum comes to um, right. You also do have a surcharge debt on your account of One second, one second. Are you alright? I'm 
so sorry. Are you all right? Now, in the event that I want to roll this out, mm -hmm. I've been advised to roll it out. Right. What is the amount I can roll over? So, uh, is it, if it was, let's just say, for example, as of today's date, mm -hmm. so it, it's that estimated amount of <laughs> surcharge debt that you have on the account. How much? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. What's that? What's this? Uh, that's a surcharge that has been on the account for quite a while. You would have seen that on your annual statement. Yes. So what it is, it's just, you. it's originated back from if we, we possibly have paid some sort of a debt um, to the AGI on your behalf. So now that this debt um, lies with, with, with state super. Oh, and it does yeah, accumulate the, interest the, the each financial one year. One two. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay, so, so there'll be no That's right. Right. And if I wait till the age of 58? Then it's the estimated the amount of it. That is correct. Uh-huh, mm -hmm. okay, okay, all right, and, um, yeah, okay, so, all right, and I think that's about it that I need from there, thank you. Okay, you're very welcome. Thanks very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, all man. Right. Bye, Donna. Oh, before, um, before, yes, before yes. you go, <laughs> what, what's the fees I pay for this? For these, the administration fees are $65 per annum, and mm -hmm. also, too, you've got your, in, um, the fees on the, um, investments. Yes, how much is that? What's the percentage? Uh, just one moment. I'll continue what you've paid. Do I if I just um, have a quick look at this for you? Yes. Um, mm -hmm. I'll make the long. Thank you. Okay. So, all up for that for the last financial year period there that you would have paid on the fees and the cost administration fees of the sixty four dollars ninety two with the indirect cost of the investments. Um, so all up the total was two thousand seven hundred and sixty eight dollars and twenty eight. Okay. So what's the like what am I paying percentage wise? Yeah, sure. So, because you've got your investments broken down, uh, mm -hmm. so what you're paying on your, let me just go back into the investment. So, for the um, growth option, um, there is what we call a, uh, it's called a, uh, just one moment, where is it? So it's called the investment management um, expense. So mm -hmm. for the growth, the uh, MER there is 0.39%. Mm -hmm. For conservative, it's 0.25%. Mm -hmm. And then for the cash, it's 0.07%. Uh, mm -hmm. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. Thanks for your help today. Bye then. All right. Bye, Donna. So Mr Henderson, that's an audio recording of a call made to a representative of the SAS superannuation fund on the 7th of November 2016, the day of your first meeting with Ms McKenna? Yes. And that's a call from someone purporting to be Ms McKenna? Yes. Uh, now, was that Ms McKenna calling? No. Was that your customer service officer impersonating Ms McKenna? Yes. Mm -hmm. And the woman from uh, SAS on the call explains to the person that she believes is Ms McKenna uh, that the normal retirement age under this superannuation fund is 58. Yes. And you heard the references throughout that conversation to this as a deferred benefit scheme. Yes. And the representative of SAS uh, told the person that she understood to be Ms McKenna uh, that if she was to access the funds earlier than age 58, there would be a particular estimated lump sum, and if she were to wait until age 58 and be permanently retired, the lump sum would be a different figure. Yes. And your customer service officer asked what could be rolled over immediately. Yes. And the representative of SAS explained the amount, less a surcharge, uh, and your customer service officer then asked what would be available if she waited until 58? Yes. Uh, and the SAS representative explained that it was a higher figure, less the surcharge. Yes. And we heard the SAS representative describe the fees. Yes. Did you know that your employee was impersonating Ms McKenna, Mr Henderson? No, I didn't. Did you hear her say at the beginning that she'd been given some questions to ask? Uh, we have standard questions for the client services managers to ask uh, for all research undertaken. It's their uh, job to invariably undertake all the research. 
Is it standard for your employees to impersonate your clients and seek information about their uh, superannuation accounts? No, absolutely not. At one point we heard there that your customer service officer put the call on hold. We heard the hold music and then she returned and said, now in the event I want to roll this out, I've been advised to roll it out, what is the amount I can roll over? Now, yes, do you know do who that. she spoke to when she put this call on hold and came back with those questions? Uh, no, I'm not sure. Were you in the office that day, Mr Henderson? I think I was in the office on that day, yes. Was she speaking to you? Uh, I, I'm not sure. I have no, no, no idea. Ms Henderson, uh, Ms McKenna was your client, Mr Henderson. Was she speaking to you about these matters? Uh, potentially, but I can't answer with any certainty. You don't recall? I don't recall. I can uh, say, though, uh, for the record, that I was not aware of the impersonation. Mm -hmm. I was quite disappointed and... Uh, I certainly apologise for that behaviour of my staff member. I was incredibly disappointed. It was inexcusable. And what was, uh, what was your reaction when you found out that your employee had been impersonating clients? I, I was horrified. Did you terminate their employment? I wanted to terminate her employment. I uh, took counsel with my general manager at work. Uh, he convinced me not to uh, terminate her employment. Instead, we gave her a warning. Um, it was borderline. Um, in hindsight, I should have persisted with my gut reaction, which was to terminate her. I feel that I, I would have uh, and should have done that. Um, we are a small team. Uh, it is like a family uh, situation in there uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and we felt that the impact uh, would be significant on on the business and uh, uh uh, on the rest of the staff. So you didn't want people to know that you had employees who were impersonating your clients? I would not hide that at all. I, I would uh, openly say that uh, she impersonated the client. It was most definitely the wrong thing to do. Uh, and I was bitterly disappointed that someone would do that uh, under, uh, under my responsibility. But you did not terminate her employment? Correct. It was pretty clear from that call, wasn't it, Mr Henderson, that Ms McKenna had to wait until the age of 58 to access the full amount of her benefit? Yes. And it was very clear from that call that if she tried to roll over her superannuation balance before then, she would forfeit her entitlement uh, to her deferred benefit? Yes. Well, I heard the recordings. I've heard all of them. Um, I, I came to the same conclusion. Absolutely. It was clear as daylight. And did your employee convey that to you as the person who was responsible for Ms McKenna? She was your client? No, I, I maybe it was my questioning around her or the verbiage around that, but again, my uh, consistent understanding was that it was a deferred benefit. Uh, again, that's been the language throughout the statement of advice, the power planning request form. Uh, and we also say that uh, we, we would never roll over and did not roll over the uh, defined benefit portion. Um, but I admit that that mistake and listening to those audios, uh, it, it's clear as daylight. I remember the first time I listened to them with the, uh, uh, when the FBA provided them to me. Um, I, I must say I was openly shocked. So, uh, so well, there's a couple of non-publication issues that apparently have emerged, uh, both the amount of the value of the loan and the uh, lender have now yes. been twice mentioned, I think, certainly value once, lender twice. Uh, both the identity of the lender and the value of the loan have been made the subject of non-publication directions. Uh, there's no occasion, is there, or is there an occasion to revisit those directions? No, no, no Commissioner. No, then uh, I'm afraid both the amount of the loan and the lender should not be reported. So is it your evidence, Mr Henderson, that having received this information uh, by impersonating Ms McKenna, your employee did not pass on that information to you? Uh, not in that fashion, no. It was not clear to me the, the type of product. I still believed, uh, uh, until I rang SAS myself uh, on the morning, uh, sorry, on the afternoon uh, before our third meeting, uh, that I, I did not understand 
the nature of the product. Uh, I did make a call myself. Uh, uh, Ms McKenna's son made a comment in our second meeting that the figures didn't look quite right and I said it just uh, wasn't quite gelling with me either and that I would make a, an inquiry myself. Uh, that night on the 14th, uh, we did have a client cocktail uh, night. I did go on holidays. I returned from holidays on the 9th uh, and on the 10th, not ideal timing, I did ring SAS uh, and uh, I do believe there is a recording of that. We'll uh, come to that. We'll yeah. come to that. And uh, that, uh, until that point, I, I believe that it was a defined benefit. So what do you say your employee did with the information that she obtained through this process of impersonating Ms McKenna? I can't speak for my employee because to me it, 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 sounded, it sounded fairly clear. Yes, but <laughs> the information was very clear, Mr Henderson, but is your evidence that your employee did nothing with it? Uh, well, it was conveyed to me as though it was a defined benefit still. I see, I see. So the next thing you did after that was to send instructions to your power planner? Uh, yes, I did. And when did you send those? Uh, I'm not sure what date the uh, power planner request form was sent. Can I show you the document containing those instructions, which is HEN 0002 001 0017? It's Exhibit 12 uh, to your statement. These are the power planning instructions that you gave evidence earlier. You took two to three hours in putting together. Yes. This is the... Well, it didn't take me two to three hours to write it, but just thinking about it and putting it together, yes. Yes. Well, it consists of uh, four-odd paragraphs, doesn't it, Mr Henderson? Yes. Um, now, we see there that the instructions you sent uh, to the power planner were firstly to establish a self-managed superannuation fund with a corporate trustee, and secondly, to roll over all member balances of particular figure, check this figure please, leaving defined benefit amounts in super. Yes. And the third instruction was to invest the balance into a Henderson Maxwell managed account in a balanced portfolio. Yes. So the only strategy that you considered for Ms McKenna was the establishment of a self-managed superannuation fund, rolling over the super into the self-managed superannuation fund and setting up a Henderson Maxwell managed account. Yes. Did you do any research into any other superannuation products? Uh, no. Did you do any research into other managed accounts that Ms McKenna could invest in? We have variously done research into all the managed accounts available. Um, in uh, specific relation to her matter, no. Uh, but in relation to uh, managed accounts as a whole, we understand that, uh, uh, well, we, we've been using the uh, HMMA for many years and we're quite satisfied with its operation. Are you familiar with the best interest obligation in the Corporations Act, Mr Henderson? Yes. What does that obligation require you to do as a financial advisor? Uh, essentially act in the best interest of our clients. And are making, you I'm sorry? Sorry, I was going to go on. Yes, please do. Uh, making sure that uh, any product that we recommend is fit for the purpose of the client and that those recommendations are free of conflict. Are you familiar with the safe harbour provision? Uh, I've heard of it, yes. What's that provision about, Mr Henderson? I've heard of it. I don't know the details. OK. So you're not familiar with the steps you have to take to satisfy the safe harbour provision? Uh, I have read them, but I can't recall them at the moment. Well, perhaps if we could have that provision brought up, it's RCD 0022003001, and if we could have 0002 on the screen at the same time. I'm sorry, 0002 and 3 we need on the screen. You can see that this is an extract from the Corporations Act. You can see that we have 961 capital B, which contains the obligation to act in the best interests of the client. Yes. And you can see that subsection 2 says that the financial advisor will satisfy the duty to act in the best interests of the client if the financial advisor proves that he or she has done each of the following. And one of those things in subparagraph E, this is the safe harbour provision, uh, in subparagraph E, um, 
uh, uh, the best interest uh, test can be satisfied if the financial adviser proves that if in considering the subject matter of the advice sought, it would be reasonable to consider recommending a financial product, um, conducted a reasonable investigation into the financial products that might achieve those of the objectives and meet those of the needs of the client that would reasonably be considered as relevant to advice on that subject matter and assessed the information gathered in that investigation. Now, do you consider, Mr Henderson, that you conducted a reasonable investigation into the financial products that might achieve Ms McKenna's objectives and meet her needs? Uh, yes, I do, actually. You do, even though your evidence was that you didn't consider any other superannuation products and you didn't specifically consider any other managed accounts? Uh, well, I did consider other managed accounts. We've been looking at other managed accounts, uh, uh, which I talked about earlier. So we do consider all options for clients. Uh, I felt in the first meeting we'd discussed what those options were and that we'd collectively uh, come to the agreement that a self-managed super fund was suitable for uh, Ms McKenna. The power plan had prepared a statement of advice in accordance with your instructions, Mr Henderson? Yes. Uh, and you've exhibited that statement of advice to your statement. It's HEN 0002 001 0018. And if we turn to um, uh, 0002 in that document, we see the summary of your recommendations. Yes. Uh, and the superannuation recommendations were to establish a self-managed superannuation fund with a corporate trustee and roll over the available funds from the SAS account into the self-managed super fund. Yes. Now, was there in fact a defined benefit portion of Ms McKenna's superannuation account? No, there wasn't. And what would have happened if Ms McKenna implemented this advice? Had it been implemented, uh, yes, she would have lost near on half a... Was the advice to Mrs McKenna uh, to establish an SMSF and roll over the balance of her SAS account in her best interests? Oh, in, the, in the light of the uh, um, erroneous nature of the research, absolutely not. And for this advice, you charged an upfront plan preparation fee of $4,950? I did, yes. And an establishment fee to set up the Henderson Maxwell managed account of $1,980? Uh, it was proposed to charge that fee, yes, it wasn't charged. Mm -hmm. If the advice had been implemented, that fee would have been charged? Yes. As would brokerage fees of $4,105? Yes. And you were going to charge an ongoing fee of $14,642 for investment management services. Yes. And how did that fee for investment management compare to the fees that Ms McKenna was paying on her existing superannuation accounts? Uh, it was materially higher. And did you point out to Ms McKenna that the fees for the product you were recommending were significantly higher? Uh, it's pointed out in the statement of advice that we went through, yes, and in our uh, statement of advice presentation, I did go through the fees with her. Was the advice to open a Henderson Maxwell managed account in Ms Henderson's, I'm sorry, in Ms McKenna's best interests? Uh, notwithstanding the error uh, made on research, then yes, I'm confident uh, of the advice and I still look back at it now and think that it's, uh, it's satisfactory. What is not satisfactory, obviously, was the error around the research. You also included an insurance review in the statement of advice. Yes. Uh, uh, why did you do that? Uh, we spoke about insurance in the first uh, meeting. Uh, that was noted in my um, contemporaneous notes taken on the day. Um, she asked me the question whether she should maintain her insurance. If you heard Ms McKenna's evidence that she didn't want an insurance review, I have. Did you propose any alternative income protection insurance to Ms McKenna? 
Uh, I suggested she consider cancelling her income protection. She made a comment that she had unlimited sick leave. Uh, so if that was the case, then it would be worth considering. Do you say that the advice to Ms McKenna to cancel her income protection insurance was in her best interests? Uh, I think given the circumstances, if she had unlimited sick leave, then there's no point in having uh, income protection insurance, so yes. You say it was in her best interests? Uh, if she had unlimited sick leave, yes. Did that's she what... have unlimited sick leave? Are you sure about that, Mr uh, Henderson? I'm not sure that she had it, but that's what she told me at the time. One of the main reasons that Ms McKenna came to you for advice was to find out about any changes she could make to the contributions to her current superannuation account with PSAP in light of the upcoming changes to the taxation laws. Did you provide advice to Ms McKenna about her contributions to her PSAP account? Uh, no, I didn't. I, I didn't think that account needed to be altered and I, uh, my understanding was she was contributing to that account. And she had higher than normal contribution rates that were permitted. Uh, so I didn't see a reason for making any changes. So you said nothing in the statement of advice about that matter? No, and I acknowledge that I probably should have. You met with Ms McKenna again on the 14th of December 2016 and you presented this statement of advice. Uh, yes, sorry, what was that date? The, the 14th of yes. December 2016. It was either the 14th or the 12th. There was no, the a change, 14th, I think yeah, it was, it was changed, changed from, from the 12th. the 12th to the 14th. Uh, uh, and you say in your second statement that the statement of advice may have appeared to have been presented to Ms McKenna for her approval and signature. Yes, I did mention it was a draft, but it was presented in a, a state, uh, which we went through a debate with the FPA around whether it was presented in... Uh, uh, in a non-draft executable format, which we agreed, yes, it was. Do you accept that it was presented to her as your recommendations? I do. And at this meeting, you scheduled another meeting with Ms McKenna? Uh, yes, we did. And you've heard her evidence that before that meeting, she sent you an annotated version of the statement of advice with a number of comments? Yes. And those comments included pointing out to you that implementing your advice would have resulted in her losing about half a million dollars? Uh, yes. Uh, at that meeting, I was on the phone. I was a little bit late to that meeting. I was on the phone to SAS and uh, that's when I discovered that uh, it was in fact, uh, very clearly, a deferred uh, benefit product. I walked straight into the boardroom and I just said, I'm so sorry, we've messed it up. Uh, uh, what would you like to do, essentially offering her uh, a, a refund? Uh, I really just wanted to neutralise the situation after realising that I'd made such a terrible mistake. I want to play you another audio recording from that date, uh, Mr Henderson, the 10th of January 2017. It's a brief audio recording, which is FPA 0006 0001 0471. Welcome to State Super. You're speaking with Svetlana. How may I help you? Yes, good, good, afternoon. good morning, really. I'm just inquiring after my defined benefit. I was wondering if you could just answer a question for me, please. Yeah, sure, Mum. Did you have your member number? I do. It is... Thank you. And uh, may I confirm your full name and your date of birth, please? Yes, Donna Sarah McKenna. And your address, please? Thank you. And how may I help you, Donna? Well, on my 30th of June statement, I had what they said a balance of mm -hmm. right? And uh, the other part of it was a deferred retirement benefit, which was mm -hmm. okay. I just need to know, if I rolled over the right? Okay, the withdrawal amount. The withdrawal amount. Mm -hmm. Can I still retain the balance? To no. You, you no. go the difference. Okay, we forego the difference. Yes, okay. because your, your, right. your scheme retirement age is 58. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, are you still working? Yes. Okay, so if you're still working um, and you don't satisfy a condition, you'd only, be, uh, you'd only be entitled to the immediate withdrawal amount and you'd right. forego the difference. Okay. Whereas okay. at 58, because yeah. you've reached the scheme retirement age, yeah. whether you're still working or yeah. not, you can roll over the full amount but you'll get that higher deferred amount. Okay, okay, yeah. all right, 
so Mr Henderson, that's another call from someone purporting to be Ms McKenna uh, to SAS Super, made in the morning of the day of your appointment with uh, Ms McKenna on the 10th of January 2017. Was that your customer service officer impersonating Ms McKenna again? Yes, it was. Did you instruct her to make that call? Uh, I don't recall, but most likely. Uh, and how many times did your employee make phone calls where she impersonated Ms McKenna? Uh, four or six. I think it might have been six. Mm -hmm. uh, I was only aware of, I was aware of four. I'm not quite sure about the PSAP uh, phone calls, but it would be consistent with the other four calls. So you say you instructed your employee to make this call, and did you do that because you had received Ms McKenna's... Uh Ms McKenna when no. making the call? No, absolutely not. So having received this information confirming that this was a deferred benefit scheme again, did this employee convey that information to you prior to your meeting with Ms McKenna? No, my uh, meeting I think was at four o'clock uh, officially. Uh, it still wasn't making sense to me so I, I made the phone call myself at that point in time having instructed your employee to make this call? Uh, yes. Did you not inquire with your employee about the results of that call? Yes, I was getting the same answer each time. It was consistently incorrect. What was consistently incorrect, Mr Henderson? Uh, my, uh, her explanation of the product as a defined benefit uh, versus Ms McKenna's comments and her son's comments around it being a deferred benefit. So you then made your own call to the SAS Super Fund uh, and did you do that identifying yourself as yourself? Yes, I think I did. Yes. Uh, and were you um, told in that call directly by the superannuation fund that this was a deferred benefit scheme and that um, uh, withdrawing an amount at this time would result in a loss of approximately half a million dollars? Yes. Did that lead you in the meeting that occurred later that afternoon to offer Ms McKenna a full refund of her advice fees? Yes. Uh, now, um, I had thought, but I may be wrong, that I had tendered the first recording. I, I have not, so I need I to tender so, both of those recordings. So can you give me the uh, The, the ID doc number. IDs, yes I can, Commissioner. The, um, if I could give you the first one. was FPA 0006000104760 and that was a telephone call on the 7th of November 2016. That will become exhibit 2.204. And the second recording was FPA 0006000104071, a telephone recording from the 10th of January 2017. That becomes exhibit 2.205. Now, Ms McKenna made a written complaint. You responded to that. I'm sorry, you'll just need to... Uh, uh, yes. Yes, and uh, you responded to that complaint in writing. I did. And in that written response, you drew Ms McKenna's attention um, to her entitlement to make a complaint to the Financial Planning Association of Australia. I did. At that time, you were a member of the FPA. I was. You've given evidence today that you are no longer a member of FPA. When did you cease to be a member of the FPA? Uh, I think it was the 30th of June, 17. 
and why? Uh, I didn't feel heard through the complaints process. I felt like I wanted to uh, express my side of the story and uh, I suppose it was a protest to not being heard. Nevertheless, I still submitted and continue to submit myself to that complaints process and I do intend on becoming a member uh, on its completion. So you don't want to be a member while the complaint is working its way through the process, but once it's resolved, you intend to be a member again? Yes. Why? Uh, I really want to make sure that uh, the systems and processes of the business are covered off, and I felt that the, uh, uh, the, the structure and uh, code of ethics around the FPA uh, can assist us in fulfilling that objective. Um, this has been one heck of a learning process for us at Henderson Maxwell. We're only a small firm uh, and we do look to our associations for direction. Um, so I would like to become a member uh, again and uh, I, I, would, um, I would like the support of the, the FPA as well and, and I'm quite happy to take the, uh, uh, the outcome of the Conduct Review Commission on the chin and implement the changes to make sure that we have the best possible business that we can have. You know, don't you, Mr Henderson, that the objects of the FPA include acting in the public interest so that clients of financial advisers can receive fair and competent advice mm. and also promoting and ensuring compliance with standards of professional and ethical conduct? Yes. Do you agree with those objects? They're worthy objects for the FPA to pursue? Yes, they are. Uh, now, Ms McKenna made a complaint about you, we've heard, to the FPA, uh, and you first heard that a complaint had been made, it seems, on the 3rd of April 2017. Uh, I... I believe so, yes. Yes, I'll could I just show you a document which is FPA 0017 0001 We see there that you received um, at 1010 to 1011, an email uh, from Mr Mark Murphy, the Professional Accountability Manager of the FPA, notifying you of this complaint. Yes. And do you see above that email on the left hand side that on the 10th of April, uh, Mr Murphy explained that the FPA would be giving you a copy of the complaint and any additional material as well as pointing to any areas of concern that the FPA had in the context of the FPA's code. Yes. What do you know about the FPA code, Mr Henderson? Uh, I've read the code and I understand that code to uh, uh, provide us with a framework uh, under which to uh, provide best practice advice to clients. And Mr Murphy went on to tell you that you'd had the opportunity to make a submission? Yes. And then you arranged to meet with Mr Murphy on the 26th of April? Yes. What did you discuss with Mr Murphy at that meeting? Uh, it was really just a factual discussion that the complaint had been received. Well, after the um, meeting, we can see at um, point 1007 that Mr Murphy sent you an email thanking for your, you for your time. We could have 00 zero seven and eight on the screen and confirming would be that the next step would be for the FPA to provide you with a written notice about the complaint. Yes. And we see your response to that email on one zero zero seven. You said, thanks for the contact, Mark. I'll await your letter and respond accordingly. I do request that this matter remains confidential given my media presence and potential financial loss as a consequence of FPA publicising the investigation in any way? Yes. Did you expect that the FPA would keep this confidential? Uh, I, I suppose I needed to understand the nature uh, and effects of the complaint and how serious those allegations were. Did you expect that the FPA would keep this confidential even if it resulted in an adverse disciplinary finding against you? Uh, no, I actually didn't expect them. I, I thought they would have published. 
Right. Could I tender that email chain, Commissioner? Emails between Murphy of FPA and Henderson, April 2017, FPA 0017-0001-1004, Exhibit 2.206. And could I take you to another email and letter, uh, which is FPA 0018-0001-0045? We see that on the 28th of April, Mr Murphy sent you a letter which commences on the following page, notifying you of the complaint in writing, along with supporting material. Yes. And we see from the first page of the letter, which is 0046, that you were advised that an investigation had been initiated and that Mr Murphy was the FPA's investigating officer for the purposes of the complaint. Yes. And could I ask you to uh, look to 0049? It's a lengthy letter, but one of the things that Mr Murphy points out to you is that in the final paragraph, in the FPA's view, quite a lot turns on the extent to which you assert the statement of advice presented to Ms McKenna was a draft and in the circumstances where of the view that there is no utility in the FPA being any more specific at this stage until this aspect has been investigated. We are also confident that you are suitably equipped to address any of the other conduct alleged in the complaint at this time, should you wish to do so. And we see from the following page that Mr Murphy asked for a response from you uh, by the 12th of May 2017. Yes. I tender that email and attachment, Commissioner. Email and letter, Murphy to Henderson, 28 April 17, FPA 0018-001-0045, Exhibit 2.207. Now, could I ask that you be shown FPA 0017-0001-0995? This is the response that you provided uh, to Mr Murphy. There is an email. Um, with an attached letter. And if we could have the first page of the letter on the screen, 0047. Sorry, so we should have that the, the um, doc IDs are not sequential. 0995 is the covering email, and then 0006 001 0047 is the attached letter. We see there, oh, I'm sorry, we don't see there. There, there we have it. So that's the first page of the letter that you sent in response um, in which you um, describe Mrs McKenna and her barrage of aggressive and presumptive accusations. Do you see that in the second paragraph? Yes, I do. And in the um, fourth paragraph down, you say, I feel I've made every effort to attempt to assist Ms McKenna in finding an amicable solution to her issues by reaching out on multiple occasions and making multiple offers without financial or other return to myself or my business. And in the bottom paragraph, you say, her written response was dismissive, comprehensive to the extreme and highly disconnected from any personal relationship and you then refer to things that you have read in the press about Ms McKenna's role as a Fair Work Commissioner in a highly critical way. Yes. And at 0048, you tell Mr Murphy that Ms McKenna has, ex has approached this situation with extreme hostility and treated me with her utmost disdain. 
I concede, though, that an error was made on her research on her deferred benefits scheme, an extremely rare super scheme, of which only 1.2 per cent of state employees have, that could have quickly and painlessly addressed given the opportunity. Do you see that? I do, yes. I was uh, frustrated. I think I was reaching out to Ms McKenna on a number of occasions and I totally understand why she didn't respond and I certainly apologise for conveying those sentiments at the time. Was it constructive for you, Mr Henderson, to write to the FPA's investigating officer describing Ms McKenna as aggressive and nitpicking and having treated you with the utmost disdain? No, on reflection that was, uh, that was unfair. I tender that letter and covering email, Commissioner. Email Henderson to Murphy, 12 May 17, FPA 0017 and letter Henderson to Murphy, 12 May 17, FPA 0006 0047 together become Exhibit 2.208. And could I then show you FPA 0017 an email chain from May 2017 between you and Mr Murphy, the investigating uh, officer. And could I ask that you look in that email chain at 0925 and 0926? Could I ask you to direct your attention to what you said to Mr Murphy at the top of the right page? I think you have everything you need in terms of my position, opinion and statement. I won't be signing the stat deck at this stage, although I have no formal issue in signing it if needed for a court process should the matter proceed in any form, given Donna is a lawyer and an aggressive one at that. I don't want to unnecessarily expose myself to any inadvertent technicalities at this stage. And frankly, I think this is a storm in a teacup but I suppose that's out of my hands with regards FPA's opinion. And further down, my response before I went on holidays was exclusively for the FPA benefit and not Donna McKenna, so I'd appreciate if you didn't share my response in its entirety with her. Clearly she'd find being labelled nitpicking inflammatory, despite it being true and publicly exclaimed. Needless to say, it wouldn't do my situation any good if you share that knowledge. I'd like confirmation around that from you, please. Mr Henderson, is it really nitpicking for Ms McKenna to make a complaint after receiving advice that, if implemented, would have cost her half a million dollars? No. Uh, if you didn't want your views about Ms McKenna to be shared with her, why did you put them in your formal response to the FPA? Uh, that was a mistake. I tender that uh, email and uh, the email chain, Commissioner. Emails between Murphy and Henderson, May uh, 2017, FPA 0017-001-0922, Exhibit 2.209. Now, Commissioner, I think I have about half an hour left with this witness. Uh, I can finish now and we can uh, have Mr Henderson return on Thursday morning or I can carry on. I'm in the Commissioner's hands. Uh, one, how are we travelling for time generally? We have time to uh, finish this witness on Thursday morning, Commissioner. Uh, Mr Henderson, how does that place you? Would you prefer to get it over and done with now or come back on Thursday? What do you prefer? I would prefer to get it over and done with now, if that's a possibility and open to me. Uh, I do have responsibilities Let's go with on family. and see how far we get, Ms Orr. I don't uh, uh, guarantee I'm going to uh, sit until we finish, but let's just see how far we get Thank you, as we go. Um, Mr Henderson, are you familiar with the FPA's Code of Ethics? Yes, I am. Uh, can I ask that you look at that document, which is FPA 0001-001-0098? And we see from 0105 to 0106, if they could both be brought on the screen, that the FPA's Code of Ethics consists, <coughs> excuse me, consists of 10 principles. 
Um, eight principles. Eight principles, I'm sorry. Eight principles of the Code of Ethics. And the first principle is client first, requiring you to place the client's interest first. Yes. Do you consider that you did that when recommending that Ms McKenna rolled over her superannuation into a self-managed superannuation fund? Uh, notwithstanding the error, yes, I do believe that that was the intention and my actions. Yeah. It was the intention, but I think your evidence earlier, uh, Mr Henderson, was that that advice was not in her best interest. In regards to the uh, deferred benefit product, uh, absolutely not. And the second principle of the FPA's Code of Ethics is integrity, which requires you to provide professional services with integrity. Do you consider that you did that when your employees were impersonating Ms McKenna on the phone? Uh, on a personal level, uh, yes, I believe I acted with integrity. I do not believe my employees acted with integrity and I do take responsibility for those employees, so that would be questionable, yes. And the fifth principle is professionalism, which requires you to act in a manner that demonstrates exemplary professional conduct. And do you consider that you did that when you responded to Ms McKenna's complaint by describing her as nitpicking and dismissing her complaint as a storm in a teacup? Uh, I believe that was a personal conversation and I think in a, in a more general sense, yes, I act professionally, but that was clearly not a professional uh, email. Uh, I tender that document, Commissioner. Exhibit 2.210, FPA Code of Professional Practice, FPA 0001-0001-0098. And could I ask that you now be shown FPA 0017-0001-0013. Uh, the communications that we've looked at just previously were in May 2017 between you and Mr Murphy, the investigating officer. But in June 2017, we see here you contacted Mr Dante de Gori. He's the CEO of the FPA? Yes. And we see on the first page in this email at 0013 that you said to Mr de Gori, this is a very disappointing process after my many years of support for the FPA. But whilst I've tried being open and honest about the situation, I'm afraid my support for the FPA is at a conclusion. Mark, who is the investigating officer, appears to have his own agenda and there's zero support for members. I'm very disappointed with this process and the FPA's treatment of members over a seemingly minor matter that was dealt with prior to the FPA's involvement by returning the client to their original position by fully refunding the statement of advice fee. No funds were invested. So you considered Ms McKenna's complaint to be a minor matter? Uh, I did at the time, and I think in hindsight that was uh, a poor judgment. I felt um, if I had put uh, the word draft across the statement of advice and I discussed that with her, uh, that could have been a simple solution to the whole issue. Um, I acknowledge now that that was poor judgment. I'm interested in what you say in the next line of this email. Mr Henderson, you say to Mr de Gori, my peers would be interested in the workings of this process and what it means to be a member of the FPA. Was this a threat to complain to other FPA members about the handling of this complaint? Oh, no, not at all. This was, um, that comment was directly in relation to my experience with the AFA who had just offered a counselling service to financial advisors. Um, I just wanted to be heard. I wanted to be able to verbally uh, express uh, my side of the story. And uh, I, I, I never got to do that apart from through submissions and I communicate much better. Uh, I felt like I could communicate better orally. I just wanted to talk to someone about it really. It was really in regards to what support and counselling do the FPA provide in respect to um, understanding the process and, uh, and a general sort of mental support around going through the complaints process it was extremely stressful. Were you hoping to influence Mr de Gori to intervene in the investigation of Ms McKenna's complaint? No, well, no. Wh why did you write to the CEO about this outstanding complaint against you? I was reaching out in a state of desperation because I felt I just wanted to be heard. 
Well, you, you were being heard all over the place with respect, Mr Henderson. You were writing emails to Mr Murphy, and I've taken you to a number of them, and it appears from the first line of this email, um, you say to Mr De Gorey, your talk with Mark appears to have aggravated the situation rather than assist. So had you suggested to Mr De Gorey that he communicate with the investigating officer in an attempt to uh, uh, intervene in this uh, handling of this complaint? Uh, I wasn't attempting to do that. I just wanted to talk to Mark face to face. I wanted him to interview me over the process so I could express um, what happened from my side orally. I attend to this email, Commissioner. Emails between Henderson and De Gorey of FPA uh, of June 17, FPA 0017 0001013, Exhibit 2.211. Mr Murphy finalised his report of his investigation in October 2017. Yes. And that report is at FPA 0019 And uh, Mr Murphy uh, made a number of findings as part of his investigation. If we turn to 0541, we see that one of his findings was that when you presented the statement of advice to Ms McKenna, you intended her to rely on it. Yes. And at 50543, um, Mr Murphy said, I am of the view that the member has not been as helpful as he could or should have been in response to the FPA investigation. He has not conveyed a sense of transparency, genuine reflection and engagement as a professional, despite me and fellow investigating officer, Ms Finnegan, meeting with the member on 26 April 2017 to preemptively address this aspect. And then uh, Mr Murphy gives examples to support that view. You see that? Oh, yes, I can see that, yeah. And also on that page, <coughs> Mr Murphy says that after concluding his investigation into the matter, at the bottom of the page, I am of the view that the member has a case to answer in respect to a number of breaches. In identifying particular breaches, I have endeavoured to address causes rather than symptoms in order to achieve the most practical professional regulatory outcome. And uh, in the following pages, Mr Murphy identifies a list of possible breaches uh, in which he considers that you have a case to answer, breaches of the FPA Code of Ethics uh, and practice standards. You know that? And finally, at 0559, Mr Murphy says, in all of the circumstances, I contend there is a strong and reasonable inference that the member's conduct stemmed from a lack of objectivity or a conscious decision to place his own interests before those of the client when the client trusted otherwise. It is not apparent that the member would not have made the same recommendations if not for his conflicts. It is not apparent that the member based all judgments on the complainant's relevant circumstances. You see that, Mr I can Henderson? See that, yes. I tender the investigator's report, Commissioner. Report to Cond Conduct Review Commission, FPA 0019 0001 0537, uh, Exhibit 2.212. And you provided a response to the investigator's report, Mr Henderson? I did, yes. And that document is FPA 0006 0001 Were you assisted by a lawyer in preparing that response, Mr Henderson? I was, and I'd probably suggest that uh, the comments made by Mr Murphy about uh, not being helpful were probably a result of having the wrong lawyer on board. Uh, I did choose a different lawyer after reading those comments. It was not my intention uh, to not be transparent. I wanted to be transparent and open throughout the process. I then switched lawyers and I was uh, represented by somebody different at that point. So you blame your lawyer for that, no, Mr No, no, I, I don't blame my lawyer for any of this. I'm to blame for this. There's a significant change in tone I want to suggest to you in this submission 
uh, to any of your previous communications with the FPA. Mm. And why do you say we see that change of tone in your response? I truly wanted to be transparent and take responsibility for the uh, for, for what had happened. Uh, I too was frustrated at the response. Uh, the first response, there were certain documents I tended to um, uh, to my lawyer at that time. Uh, they were not provided, and uh, I, I then made some changes uh, to my legal representation at that point to make sure that. Uh, we were open in admitting where I'd made mistakes uh, and I wanted to be transparent and take ownership and accountability for what had happened with Ms McKenna. So with your lawyer's assistance, you make a number of acknowledgements and apologies in this document, is that right? Yes, I've, uh, I've apologised a lot uh, throughout this process and I, I highly regret what had happened. Uh, and having acknowledged uh, a number of issues in this document, you address the different breaches that Mr Murphy had said you had a case to answer for mm. and for each one in this document you submitted either that it should be dismissed completely on the basis that it didn't constitute a breach or that you did not have a case to answer or it should be characterised as a minor instance of unsatisfactory conduct and your case should be summarily disposed of. Uh, yes, I had to seek advice around that. Okay, attend to that document, Commissioner. And as in response to investigators' report, FPA 006 001 Exhibit 2.213. And in November 2017, following on from Mr Murphy's investigation report and your response, the FPA issued you with a notice of disciplinary proceedings? Yes. And after that, your lawyers negotiated an outcome to those disciplinary proceedings with the FPA? Yes. Could I take you to FPA 0005, 0001, 0001? Uh, this is an email which attaches uh, an agreed proposal to resolve the disciplinary proceedings. If we could turn to um, 0002, we'll see the first page of that proposal. And at 0003, we see that as part of this proposal, you agreed to a finding that you had failed to take due care in delivering professional services, in that you failed to adequately ascertain the nature of Ms McKenna's SAS account. Yes. And at 0004, you agreed to a finding that you failed to consider whether Ms McKenna's current superannuation strategy could have met her objectives, needs and priorities. Yes. And at 0007, you agreed to a finding that your recommendations were not adequately tied to Ms McKenna's objectives, needs, priorities and personal circumstances. Yes. And at 0008, you agreed to a finding that your recommendations did not identify why the Henderson-Maxwell managed account service was suitable for Ms McKenna? Yes. And at 0010, you agreed to a series of sanctions, including that you would train your staff and review your current practices and appoint an independent expert to review those changes? Yes. And we see at 0011, that it was agreed that in consideration of you complying with undertakings and warranties set out in the sanctions, that the FPA would be restrained from publication of your name in connection with the disciplinary proceedings and the outcome of the matter, including the agreed sanctions. Yes. And in March this year, this proposal was submitted to the Conduct Review Commission Yes. That's an independent body connected with the FPA? Yes. I want to just take you to that, but first I tender that document, Commissioner. Email and attachment concerning agreed disposal of CRC disciplinary proceedings, FPA 0005, 0001, 0001, Exhibit 2.214. The Chair of the Conduct Review Commission wouldn't accept this proposal, would he, Mr Henderson? No. He thought that you needed to have some further sanctions imposed. Yes. And in particular, he thought that it wasn't consistent with the outcome of the disciplinary proceeding for you to engage in public media appearances 
for 12 months following the imposition of the sanctions. Yes. And what was your reaction to that proposed additional sanction? Uh, we asked, uh, I can't remember the specific verbiage around that, but uh, we did ask for some modification around that. You weren't prepared for the matter to be dealt with on that basis, were you, Mr Henderson? Uh, we did ask for some modification on it. Yes. Has the disciplinary proceeding now been resolved, Mr Henderson? Uh, I, I, not definitively, no. Why not? Uh, I think there's still a matter or two outstanding or final sign-off. I'd have to ask uh, my legal representative as to where that's at. Well, can I assist by showing you a final document, which is FPA 0019 0001 0013. This is an email dated the 13th of April this year with an attachment. It's an email sent by your lawyer to the FPA about 10 days ago. Mm -hmm. And on the first page, we see that your lawyer uh, says to Mr Bacon at the FPA, Mr Henderson proposes that the matter be summarily disposed of on the basis that the FPA expresses concerns regarding Mr Henderson's conduct and that he acknowledges those concerns and agrees to certain sanctions. Yes. And in the page that follows, we see that your lawyer has provided a revised version of the agreed proposal that we saw previously. And we can see as we look through that revised document that you no longer accept any of the findings that I took you to earlier all of those have been reframed on the basis that you acknowledge that the FPA has some concerns about those matters. Yes, I think we're going to rely on the independent report. So have you resiled from your earlier acceptance that you breached those FPA standards, Mr Henderson? Uh, we accept that there's uh, concerns around those, yes. But you've resiled from your proposal to accept findings about those matters. I would have to seek legal advice to answer that one accurately, but uh, we did seek to uh, alter the uh, final outcome of that, yes. We see, don't we, in this document that the agreed findings have been replaced with agreed outcomes which acknowledge FPA's concerns. Yes. You gave instructions to adopt this course. Uh, I'll say yes. Yes. And so uh, all this time later, following Ms McKenna's uh, complaint to the FPA in March 2017, the complaint remains unresolved. Uh, my understanding was that it was verbally resolved and it was just waiting on the uh, stamp. There is no formal resolution of that complaint. There is no is formal there? resolution as of today, no. Thank you. I have no further questions, Commissioner. You tend to that last oh, I'm document, sorry, I Ms. do. Law. Thank you, Commissioner. Email of 13 April 18 and attached revised proposed summary disposal agreement FPA 0019 0001 0013 becomes Exhibit 2.215. Mr Woods. A mere handful of questions, I believe, Commissioner. Um, Mr Henderson, um, I want to ask you a couple of uh, questions about some documents that have been provided uh, to the Commission and are, and are on the Commission system but have not yet been tendered. Can I ask um, that firstly uh, the document that's identified um, as uh, LOA signed in its file name be brought up on the screen? Could you identify that document please, Mr Henderson? Now, that is a letter of authority uh, signed by Donna McKenna to uh, enable uh, staff members of Henderson Maxwell, uh, Henderson Maxwell to inquire on her behalf. Yes, and it indicates that it was signed on the 7th of the 11th, 2016. That was your first meeting with Ms McKenna, is that correct? Yes. And um, what was your understanding of, of... Sorry, secondly, I want to um, bring up on the screen... Um, I tender that document firstly. Sorry, Commissioner. Um, yes. And secondly, uh, a letter um, uh, called uh, Research... Just, just before we go on... Uh, it was not, I think, put to uh, Ms McKenna, was it? Does anything turn on that? No? Well... I don't believe so. Exhibit uh, <coughs> 2.216 uh, will be 
a document described as letter of authority McKenna to Henderson Maxwell bearing date 7 uh, November 16. I, I don't want to be seen to say nothing turns on it, Commissioner. I have no idea whether anything turns on it. What I do know is it was not put to Ms McKenna. Yes. No, that's correct, it wasn't. Um, and secondly, um, uh, the document that uh, has the file name uh, research. Um, now, can you identify what that document is, please, Mr Henderson? Uh, that's a file note just to say that the letter of authority was sent to PSSA and SAS on the 7th of November. And where's that file note taken from? Uh, that's our client management system. All right. Um, I tender that document as well, Commissioner, and that's the last one to tender. We've got 2.217. Um, Just one moment. We'll be uh, file note concerning uh, Ms McKenna, uh, 7 November 16. Now, Mr Anderson, are you aware of whether or not that letter of authority was received by State Super? I don't believe it was. Uh, in my phone conversation on the 10th of January, uh, I did make a comment that they should have it on file and she said she couldn't find it. This was in so a telephone conversation with State Super? Correct. Um, all right. And um, I now want to ask you um, a couple of questions about um, the implementation and whether or not the meeting uh, on the 14th of December you made some um, comments to the Commission earlier about your, um, uh, the nature of this advice that was provided and that, that it had the uh, tabs on it to be signed. Um, was there another meeting to come after um, this meeting on the 14th of December uh, 2016? Yes, there was. All right. Um, and um, what's your evidence in relation to whether or not this would have been implemented had it not been the, mis the error been pointed out to you by Ms McKenna? Uh, I did say to Ms McKenna's son that I would follow it up myself. Uh, I didn't, did in fact follow it up myself uh, on the 10th uh, of January. Um, and part of the process, as Ms McKenna stated also, is that the client does take away the statement of advice uh, and we do rely on a, uh, uh, a discussion with the client. And uh, I also said that I would follow up uh, on that state super product. Um, which I did. All right. Um, you, just another issue. Um, you've um, made a comment a little bit earlier about the apologies um, and, and the refund. Um, I, I won't put each of them to you, but there were a number of occasions that Ms McKenna gave evidence about on which she was apologised to by you. Do you accept that those were times where you, where you apologised for this error? Yes. And refunded the money within refunded the fee within days. So. Absolutely, yeah. And just finally, I think, in relation to your um, FPA membership, um, you, uh, w what was the date on which you ceased being a member of the FPA? I think it was the 30th of June 17, but I would probably need clarification on, and, on that. All right. It, was it around that date? I, I think it's financial year to financial year. Yes. I, I, I can't so did you just let it lapse, did you? Yes. Um, and what's your understanding about uh, whether you have obligations to engage in the ongoing processes of the FPA, given that you're not a member? Uh, my advice has been that I do not need to continue to engage with the FPA. Why are you doing so? Uh, I would like this to be dealt with. I'd like it to be brought to a close, and if that means disciplinary proceedings, then I'm willing to accept that. Uh, I would also like to continue to be a member of the FPA. I do see it as the, uh, uh, you know, one of the two main associations, and I want to be associated with having not only a membership, but using this experience as an opportunity to improve the business. Thank you, Mr. Henderson. Nothing further, Commissioner. Thank you, Mr. Woods. Mr. Henderson. Um, you told me early in your evidence that you had considered terminating the employment of the employee uh, who impersonated uh, uh, Ms McKenna, is that right? Yes. Uh, we've heard the recording of the conversation that employee had with the relevant fund, is that right? Yes. Now, 
it seems to me that the employee uh, who had impersonated Ms McKenna either told you what she had found out or she did not. Is there any other uh, available outcome other than that she told you what she found out or she did not? I don't believe so. If she did not tell you what she had found out, would you consider that to be uh, a serious failure in performance of her duty? Yes. If she told you what she had found out, does it follow that you did not act on what she told you? I think her explanation of the product uh, continued to confirm my understanding of the product. Yeah. Uh, that's where I got lost. Mr Woods, is there anything arising out of that? Ms Orr? Thank you, Commissioner. Very well, thank you, Mr Henderson. You may step down. You're excused further attendance and we will stand over until 9.45 on uh, Thursday next.